All right, this is the U Pike Kentucky Bar Foundation's presentation of our judicial series 2021. And our speaker today is going to be uh, Corey Krieger, who is um, an attorney, and he is also um, a University of Pikeville graduate. And I am Nancy Cade, and I'll be conducting a little bit of the interview. It's going to be more of just kind of a chat with Mr. Krieger and find out what he is doing with his law degree. Now, Corey, you were my student, so I know you pretty well, but at what point in your life do you think you decided that you wanted to be a lawyer? Hey, thank you so much for having me, Dr. Kate. I appreciate it. Um, it's a great question. You know, you, you always run into people who uh, you have conversations with and they're like, I knew from the time I could walk, I wanted to be an architect, right? Like one of my good friends from high school all the way through school. I want to be an architect. I want to be an architect. And now he's an architect. He lives in D.C. He's, he's having great living the dream. Um, I wanted to be an optometrist as a child. Uh, and then I decided I did not like science. And then when I made it to uh, UPAC, I, I discovered a love for, for history, political science, that kind of theater. And I uh, was an education major, actually. Uh, and my, I come from a family of teachers. Uh, my, my mother is a assistant principal in uh, a Pike County school system. Uh, aunts are educators. So I felt natural to me. Um, and right up until I got to the point where student teaching was and the rubber was going to meet the road and I just had a crisis, I told my mom that my heart's not in it. Like, I, I, I think it's going to be a disservice. I, I, I don't I don't have a passion for this. And it was actually through conversations with you, with my mom, with my, my pastor at the time um, that I decided that, you know, uh, I, I was in it. You know, I'd already had three and a half years of undergrad under my belt. I was already on a five year track anyway, because, you know, why, why do in four years what you could stretch into five? And uh, I decided that I was going to finish the last year out and, and start applying for law school. So right before I started doing the student teaching, I had to do an extra semester and a half. I think I only had eight hours my last semester, bare, bare, hardly uh, part-time. And, uh, but yeah, so it was somewhere around junior year of undergrad that I, I realized that my heart wasn't in to be an educator and I want to go to law school. So you didn't take the traditional path of a criminal justice major or a political science major with that focus being going to law school. You were going somewhere else. But you ended up at in law school and you went to law school at Liberty, correct? Yeah, Liberty University School of Law. I think I was the I was the fourth class in the law school. I might be wrong on that. I may have been a little bit later down the road, but we were a fairly new law school at that point when I when I went to Lynchburg. Yeah. So it was. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I ended up in Lynchburg, Virginia. I actually, I remember um, telling you. That, uh, that I was going to say, Nancy, you'll never believe this. I got a flyer with uh, Newt Gingrich on it, and uh, I'm going to go and visit the law school. And you said, well, that sounds fine, Corey. Why don't you go and visit <laughs> the law school? And I, I fell in love with the area. I fell in love with, uh, you know, it, Lynchburg is a beautiful, beautiful area if you've never been there. still It feels a lot like eastern Kentucky where I grew up, and, uh, yeah, I, I loved it. All right. If you had it to do all over again, your undergraduate career. Thinking now what you know about just law school, not necessarily the practice of law, just law school. Would there have been classes that you would have taken that as an undergraduate that you think would have helped you in law school or skills that you would have worked on? Yeah, so I think there's two parts to that. Um, for, the, for the just general application of like, it would have helped me in law school, um, any type of philosophy class. A lot of law school, what a lot of my professors talked about was um, it's a retraining of the way you look at issues, right? Um, you're you're kind of, as you grow up and, and as you're raised in your own household and even going through the, the education system, there, there's it's black and it's white, right? But so much of the law is an interpretation of a, of a vague uh, phrase or a turning of a phrase or, or how to distill what you want from a legal opinion even if that's not what the judge was saying but it it you can make it what you want it to say uh so any kind of class that challenges you to think in a way that is not your traditional linear thinking would have been a great uh asset 
for me, selfishly, uh, in the healthcare containment field, I wish I could have taken some gen ed and anatomy classes, any type of like general yeah. kind of pre-medical classes. Uh, we have a lot of people at my company that we do a lot of claim reviews and we'll get into that more and more, but uh, they, a lot of people who were traditional uh, RNs or LPNs come into an office setting to help uh, the interpretation of bill codes and stuff like that. That would have helped. And then I think we can all look back and say, man, it, especially the era that I went to school, right, right on the cusp of really everything blowing up in the cyber world, anything with, with cyber security, anything with the, the IT structure of a, like, I really missed the boat and it could have really helped me be a visionary in the field. Just right in that time that I was in UPAC, I, I really just missed the boat on taking those uh, kind of advanced uh, where the world was heading classes. So that's kind of a, just an off shocks moment in general, not necessarily if it would help with uh, what I'm doing in law, but, but there's whole new fields of law that have emerged uh, based on cyber crimes and, and, uh, networking issues and network security so that would have been my answer that's kind of, that's kind of interesting uh, you know traditionally i hear from litigators that they wish they had taken more classes in writing and more classes in even creative writing which i kind find kind of amusing but you know to learn how to write more and yours your because of where you have ended up being in the legal field you're a little bit more techno, you're a little bit more, um, if you will, almost subject matter specific rather than mm. being interested in just the, the general skills of, of writing and speaking and all that kind of stuff. And I don't think students normally think about that, about mm. what directions they could end up going in. All right, so you ended up um, going to law school, going to um, I'm going to call it a little bit non-traditional law school, and that's not a criticism in any way, shape, or form. What I mean by that is because it was a new law school, mm -hmm. they were still finding their way as to what their directions would be. You know, a lot of law schools are very well established for being, this is where you produce a lot of litigators, or this is where you're going to see a lot of corporate lawyers come out of. But Liberty was still trying to kind of find their direction. And I'll bet that opened a lot of interesting avenues mm -hmm. for exploring subject matter in your classes. Did it? Yeah, so, so that's, that's a really great question. So one thing that was established because of, of Liberty and, and they're, they're tied to the undergrad and, and the beliefs of the undergrad was, is that we knew that the, the law school was gonna have a public policy focus, right? But I never had the appetite for, um, that kind of minutia, statutory interpretation, you know, statute drafting, behind the scenes work. I, mm -hmm. I didn't really ever want to be in the politics. Politics interested me, and, and it's a great theory, and it's great something to talk about. But I, it, I never want to go down that alley, even as from a lobbyist standpoint, or even you know, we have some ties to the Heritage Foundation, things like that. None of that really piqued my interest. What I did find at the law school, and what Liberty has really created a, a good niche in that, that they're really successful. One with uh, consistently uh, top two or three uh, school in Virginia for bar passage rates. And when you think about the law schools that come out of Virginia, that's really saying much or saying a lot. You know, you got UVA there, you got George Mason, you got all the Beltway schools. So that's great. And then the other thing that they excel in is, is national recognition and moot court and trial team. So I actually did two years on the trial team there. And I thought that that was where I was going to end up. I love the trial competitions, the mock trial competitions, the long hour prepping, that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, so I spent a lot, I actually graduated with a, with a focus in uh, trial advocacy and here I am six years removed and I've, I've been inside of a courtroom my first six months when I hung a shingle uh, and I haven't been back since. So it's uh, interesting the way things change based on circumstances. That is kind of interesting because I can, knowing the Corey that I knew in college, it wouldn't have surprised me to see you as a litigator. Mm -hmm. um, just because you were really good at arguing. Um, and, and you were also one of those people that could argue multiple sides of something. Um, and I think that makes for a good litigator because you always got to know what the other side is thinking. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I find that interesting. All right, moving on just a little bit. You now are in a branch of legal work that I am... 99% sure most of the people 
whether they are students viewing this or whether they are community people viewing this are not going to have a clue what what you mean so jump in let's kind of try to help people understand what it is that you do sure yeah the great question so what do i do um the, I, I work for a company called The Fiat Company. We're, we're headquartered out of Massachusetts, but we just opened an office in Louisville, Kentucky about uh, almost two years ago. So I've been there going on almost 18 months now, Fiat. Mm-hmm. But ever since um, I moved to Louisville for, for opportunity, I've been in the healthcare cost containment field. Uh, what does that mean? <laughs> that means that the cost of healthcare is high. Um, whether you have insurance through your employer, uh, right? Uh, a typical Buka insurance is the term of art, Blue Cross, United, Cigna, Aetna. Or if you have uh, a state funded, uh, my, my dad and my mom work for uh, the, the government of Kentucky, so they have their, their state plan. Um, the cost of going to a healthcare provider is high. How do we lower the cost of healthcare? from a consulting side. So our clients at the FIA group are what are called third-party administrators or TPAs. These TPAs administer benefits, not for your big health insurances that normally kick off your Aetna's, your Blue Crosses. They administer benefits for what's called small employee benefit plans. So let's unpack that just for a second and it's all gonna make sense. So I am a small business owner with 50 to 75 employees. I can't afford, or it's in the best interest of my business to not get in bed with a traditional big insurance company because of the bottom line ramifications. Instead of providing health insurance that way, I'm going to collect a portion of my employees' paychecks the same way an Aetna would if your benefits were deducted. I'm gonna then put that in a pool of money that grows, And as my employees treat, a plan administrator is going to pay for those claims, a specialist. So in essence, the employer is managing the pool of money as opposed to Aetna, Blue Cross, Cigna. It is a small pool of money that is all employee-based contributions that is then used to pay for healthcare. So So is this what we would, what some people would refer to as a company that is self-insured? Exactly. That's exactly right. It's a self-funded or a self-insured plan. So obviously these small companies make up the vast majority of businesses across, across the country. When you talk about number wise, of course, Amazon and your big companies have the large number of employees, but when you're talking about the amount more businesses are small businesses. So they don't have the leverage points with your massive health systems, right? Take your mercy health system in Ohio, right? vast healthcare system that a buka can walk in a blue cross or an Aetna, and they can they bring with them tens of or hundreds of thousands of lives and they enter into a network contract and that network contract says if you come and if your patients come and treat at my facility then you only have to pay us x percent of what we bill go back to my example the 50 to 75 person employee benefit plan doesn't have those leverage points. So how can we save their costs and still apply uh, and still have effective healthcare coverage? So we're trying to drive down what providers charge, the build charges for services, and we're trying to help preserve the funds of that self-insured employee benefit plan. So hopefully that at least frames the conversation of what the problem that the FIA group is attempting to uh, solve. Healthcare is too, costs too much. How do we work together to drive the price of healthcare down? So how does your law degree help you do whatever it is that you do? Yeah, sure. So I'm actually a staff attorney at the FIA group. So we provide all kinds of different services, right? We are a consultant. If you need to make changes to your plan uh, document that governs how benefits are administered, we're going to aid with that from one side. We are a subrogation entity. We provide recoupment of funds when uh, when uh, patients are injured through no fault of their own via accident. Uh, I 
specifically work in the provider relations department, which touches a lot of different things. We work on, I work on mostly balance billing. So a patient goes to a hospital, uh, they do not know that the, that the hospital is, is not going to accept the payment by their health plan as payment in full because there's not a traditional network contract. They go and they treat. And then three months later, they get a bill for $20,000 when they went to the ER for a kidney stone and they were sent home with a, with a Vicodin prescription and not much else done, but they have a $30,000 medical bill, even though their health plan has already paid $10,000 uh, because whatever facility decided to bill 40 grand for an ER visit because it was over it was overnight and it was two different days and, and you were there for eight hours, so you took a bed up and all these things that they do to, to get these charges through the roof. We come in and help resolve those issues where people have these bone crushing debt. I, I believe the statistic is uh, three out of every four bankruptcies in the United yeah. States are due to medical debt. So we are trying to resolve that issue specifically. So, you know, some of that is um, responding to uh, different arguments that the providers are making. Providers may cite specific state statutes that they can the, their charges are usual and customary and, and you know, X statute points to that they're, that's a fair billing and they should be paid their fair amount. So statutory interpretation goes in that way. Public policy changing does go into that way, you know, uh, goes, goes into that. How do we effectively um, encourage transparency in this industry? That, that's a big focus. You know, no, no other business transaction, because let's get right down to it. Healthcare in the United States is a business transaction, right? That's they so have hard. a good that I need, and I'm going to pay literally maybe an arm and a leg for it, depending on what's going on. And I have to have it. So I'm going to go. No other transactional industry that exists in the United States do, do you let one party have all the cards. I don't go to the car dealership and they say, no, 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 take the car, we'll bill you. And then I say, okay, great, I'm going to take this car. And then three months later, find out that they that they're charging me $55,000 for a 1988 you know, geo tracker, but, but we're okay with it in the healthcare industry. You don't get to walk into the doctor's office and see a menu of prices for, well, I need an appendectomy, $8,000, supersize it because I want to make sure I get a good surgeon, right? So I'll, give me the upcharge and I'll pay 12,000 for it. That's just not how the industry works. And it's, it's bonkers. So when you have one side controlling all of the, the influence, of course, prices are going to go out of control because there's no balance. So being able to make those public policy arguments, but the, the key thing that I do all day long is negotiate, right? And, and, and that's, you know, we have X amount of dollars that we're willing to pay to resolve this balance bill on behalf of the patient. The health plan will make an additional payment, but you have to be reasonable provider, you know, $20,000 for a, a, an aspirin prescription and an MRI and a kick out the door. That's not cutting it. We got to meet someplace else. So that's the key thing. It, it, it's all about negotiation when, when you're getting into the bones of either negotiating a, a new network contract for a plan or resolving a balance bill, uh, you know, knowing how to talk to people, relationships and, and negotiating are, are the key points there. So in a way, you're a non-courtroom litigator. I mean, you're arguing like you would in a courtroom about things. But yep. what, I'm, what I'm finding so interesting is I was listening to you talk I, I found something popped into my head that I, I think is kind of interesting. Normally, when we talk about um, healthcare costs in the United States, so often, and I know with my own experience, so often it has been me versus the insurance company. Mm -hmm. The insurance company is not going to pay whatever it is, and I have to argue with the insurance company. Well. In a way, you're representing both the patient and the insurance company against, against the healthcare provider. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole different realm. I mean, so often when we think of people going to um, bankruptcies, a lot of times it's because they didn't have an advocate in their insurance. Um, and a lot of people don't realize that there are insurance advocates out there that, that can work for them. I know my, my insurer has such a thing, but that's exactly what you do. 
And that's a really interesting angle because again, we, we tend to think of it as us versus the insurance company and us versus the hospital. We don't think of it as maybe the insurance company and the patient could actually be on the same side because they're trying to bring the costs down. And at the same time, you still want the insurance company and the hospital to have good relations so that they will take your insurance. <laughs> yep. There's so much going on there. So, so much to unwrap about that relationship that it, 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 it's kind of fascinating. And like you said, it's very interesting that you are, you know, you were originally interested when you were in law school in um, the litigating side and you're still trying to make deals. And that's what a lot of litigators do. That's you're, it. Still, you're still trying to make deals. And you were also, you went to a school that was very interested in um, policy development and politicians and, and the political realm. And in a way, what you do is implementing and trying to improve public policy. So you're rolling it all together into your mm -hmm. career in a totally different way. What made you, by the way, what made you interview with FIA? What made you interested in FIA? Yeah, so that's a, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, so I was at, I was originally at a segregation vendor that, that serviced a lot of uh, big, your traditional health plans. Right. Um, and I, the environment just wasn't great for me. Um, the, the amount of hours, thing, things of that was just, uh, it just wasn't conducive to, to what my personal family goals were. So uh, I left that job and, and went to work at a startup for a little bit. Um, and, you know, Coming out of law school, uh, I hung a shingle and I actually worked with Herbie Deskins in, in Pikeville for right. a little bit and, and did a lot of stuff. And, and I should have learned a lesson there that I am I am very risk averse and um, I really like steady two week paychecks. And so when you're hanging your own shingle or going into a startup, as I learned five years later, um, there's just some things that, um, that there's some extra worry, right. Uh, of what goes on. So I, I put myself in, in, in a situation that I really should have, uh, met, prayed and, 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 and really meditated on and, and sought some better counsel before I, before I kind of jumped in with both feet. Uh, but, but I was there for a little while and, uh, I knew I loved the, I, I, I was doing lean resolutions. So I was still in the realm of, uh, personal injury, uh, resolving liens, uh, working on behalf of patients. Uh, but then uh, I saw, uh, I, I, I was just wasn't happy right of where I was at the startup. So I started looking at, and FIA kind of had the best of both worlds where it was a steady corporate job with uh, a more conducive atmosphere for where, where I wanted to be with my life and my family and my personal goals. Uh, and it was a steady two week paycheck with the, with an established, you know, 30 year, company in the, in the Boston area. Um, and it was, it just worked out as a great match. They just happened to open a Louisville office because Louisville is a, a big insurance hub. There's a lot of big players, uh, Humana in town. A lot of the big subrogation vendors are in town. Uh, we have an Aetna office, Blue Cross office. So we, we have a lot of a good hub here. And Sophia opened a, a Louisville office and wanted some Louisville talent, uh, specifically uh, Louisville talent that had background in the, the healthcare industry and that was me and so so here I am a uh, little uh, little guy from eastern Kentucky working for uh, a Boston based business in Louisville so there, there you go it's a it's a great it's a great American dream story there <laughs> and it's a great fit for you yeah. uh, one of the things that you just said a few minutes ago that I thought was was really interesting is how many students go to go to college and they think they're going to become a lawyer and they think they're going to be rich Oh. They think they're going to make millions of dollars because you see in town, you see some very wealthy lawyers. Sure. And they don't realize that I read not that long ago that the average starting salary for a lawyer in Kentucky, if they can get a job in law, which is not really easy to get, but if they can get a job at a law firm, was $35,000 a year. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, if you've just got $100,000 worth of student loans, 
$35,000 a year, you're going to make it. The math doesn't add up. (laughs) No, it just doesn't. And if you're working um, on what, you know, build hours and I'm going to call it commission type work because that's what it is. You're paid. You're paid basically by the hours you bill. You know, you're not going to get rich that way easily. And so some of these corporate jobs, like what you are doing, might appeal to a prospective law student who, like you, wants the the regular salary, wants the stable job, doesn't want to be working till nine o'clock every night, which early young lawyers do put in an awful lot of hours. Mm-hmm. And so this might be a field where people becoming a corporate attorney um, might be something, and, and by that, I mean, an attorney working for a company might be something, an in-house attorney might be something that would appeal to an awful lot of people. It did to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so much of, of a small independent practice or and building, you know, listen, the the billboard guys, right? You know, Louisville. I'll, I'll use my I'll use my examples in Louisville, right? Isaac and Isaac, um, <laughs> Sam Aguiar. You know, we got a big Morgan and Morgan office here. Like these guys worked their tails off to get where they are. And but what the the thing that those big billboard PI guys have that that I just frankly didn't have. Um, you know, when they start off, they're entrepreneurs at heart, right? Um, they're they're go getters. I, I, I don't want to say that I'm not a hard worker, but they're, they're hard oh, workers, you're, you're they're go getters. Yeah, but like the the things and the sacrifices they made. What what the, people don't see when they see John Morgan on their TV or, or Sam Aguiar or, or you know uh, Vanover Hall, Hall Bartley, whoever the local attorney is, is they don't see the 20 years where it was you know, one year making $50,000, $55,000 a year. And then the next year, a great case walked in, but I got to plan off for my next three years because probably can't guarantee another $400,000 mm-hmm. settlement coming in. Um, and, you know, those guys that make it, great for them. But that's not every attorney. You know, the reason that that statistic that you gave is so low with with attorneys is, is that, um, you know, most of those entry level jobs coming out, you, you know, you, you hit your high turnover fields, right? Your your uh, public defender's office, right? Uh, or your your kind of churn and burn, get your two years of experience at X law firm, billing X hours, and and kind of sell your soul out for two for two years, and then you can go get a better job. Um, neither of those things kind of you know appealed to to my sensibilities with what I wanted, um, with my life, you know, I, I, I've always been a family first guy, you know, that about me. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm okay with, I've come to realization in terms with, you know, I'm not going to have the Krigger and Krigger empire underneath me, but, um, I'm, I'm okay with that because of the, the payoff on the front end of, you know, I have two beautiful daughters that are, that are very young and, I've, I've never had to miss an occasion that I didn't want to miss. And so, you know, you can't put a price on some of that stuff, but yeah, you know, TV movies, the, the, the commercials themselves, they, they paint a picture of, of, of uh, that, that often is disconnected from reality when you, when you get down to the statistics, not to say that the legal field is not a, a good and noble profession. It is. And, and public defenders are, good people and and we need good public defenders for for a litany of reasons um but the reason it's high turnover is is are you going to make a living on are you going to pay that debt that you have for that piece of paper making 40 50 a year and it, it, the math just doesn't work and and i have to comment that you never can tell you may your daughters made you know, get together and form Krieger and Krieger and support you in your old age. That, that's fair. You know, the, the goal is, is to have enough <laughs> children that I get at least one crazy successful one. So we're just going to, we just got to play the odds, right? It's just play the odds. Keep having kids. One of them, will, one of them will hit a big. It's fine. And, and hopefully that one will want to support you in your old age. 
Well, see, that's the that's the double edged sword, right? <laughs> is 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 you gotta you gotta make sure you push them enough to be great, but not so much that they resent you in your old age and they just find, hey, Dad, that's the home you're going to. Okay, thanks, guys. <laughs> All right, you spend so you spend much of your day, I would guess, on the phone, emailing with the hospitals group whoever that is, whether it's their attorney, whether it's elevated to that point or, Mm -hmm. or their offices. And you just kind of spend, I would think the bulk of your day trying to make a deal. Yeah. 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 And that is the kind of job that you can do from home, which Mm -hmm. is nice. Um, but it's also a kind of job where I would think you would need to know the legal statutes. You would need to know these things off the tip of your finger. So this is a specialist job. This is not something that you want to trust to your local attorney who is a public defender, or you want to trust something like this to your, to your own, you know, maybe family attorney who specializes in wills and trusts. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of thing where there are specialists that can do this. Now, you work with FIA Group, so obviously you've developed your specialty with them. Are there people that do what you do as a part of their practice or as their sole practice as an independent practitioner? Yeah, uh, so that's a That's a really good question. So a lot of groups or uh, employee benefit plans, they can hire uh, as their plan administrator or local counsel just for the particular group. Yeah, there's nothing that would stop that uh, from happening. We have some small, uh, we we, we have some partnerships with some firms that that manage um, some benefit plans. So yeah, it it can happen outside of uh, of a, a corporate setting, but I would wager to say that most of those people probably gained experience in a company similar to FIA and then went out with the specialized knowledge to be able to provide that type of um, that type of assistance to on, on an individual basis as opposed to a core base because the other thing that you have to think about is you know um, if you're going to do that and 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 go out on your own to represent these these plans you know the plans have to pay you but the plan also has to manage the funds of the plan, right? Mm -hmm. So what does the plan pay to have a lawyer on retainer versus when you're talking about a larger corporation that has a number of clients, you know, we're not living and dying by every single client that comes through the door. There's some more flexibility on payment. Maybe we can get you on a sub model. Maybe you don't have to pay X amount because you have so many lives, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there, there would definitely be some obstacles that that working in, at a company kind of d- dissolves when, when you were when you're talking about that. So what you do is not something that, you know, a lawyer can do really reasonably well part time or anything like that. Um, this is most likely in an in-house setting. So you're not going to be you as an individual, as 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 my, you know, my friend, Corey, who's an attorney does not go out and find clients. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, like, you know, I honestly, uh, I did some, I did some wills. I did some deeds like right out of law school. Uh, I did some, um, guardian ad litem cases and stuff like that. Uh, and, and I did have clients in, in that traditional sense, but no, you know, the, the, the clients are the companies, right? So we have our own sales staff that goes and sells FIA and the services that FIA provides to different TPAs, to different health groups. Uh, and then I come in and ensure that I have clients that I have relationships with and that I'm emailing, but they're not Corey Krigger's clients. They're, right. they're FIA's clients. Uh, and, and, you know, as far as, yeah, so I don't, you know, and, and, and honestly, it, it, it's kind of a disservice, uh, I don't want to say a disservice, but, you know, you, when you when you go to your family practice doctor, uh, you don't go for it. You, you go to him when you got a head cold, when you have mm-hmm. general things wrong. But, you know, if, if you 
fractured your leg in three places, you're going to go and see a specialist, right? So I kind of think of, you know, you can have your kind of family general attorneys that do great work that do, that kind of touch all the big areas that, that we, you had talked about. You know, we can do wills, we can do deeds, we can do trusts, you know, we can do some PI here, we can do that. But um, yeah, as for me, you know, I, I get, it, it, it's great. Uh, you, you get all kinds of unsolicited questions when you don't really need clients of like, hey, Corey, you still practicing law? You all, it, it's always fun to hear people that you haven't talked to in a long time, just shoot you that random text. And I always just tell people, you know, like, I haven't practiced in what you were probably going to ask me about since I studied for the bar, but I can probably recommend you to somebody. I can give you a gut feeling, uh, but you need to talk to someone who does it for a living because, you know, the, the, the legal field is a specialized industry and you need people who excel at one thing, right? And, and that's how you're going to get the most bang for your buck. And I would say that to, to someone in any industry, right? You wouldn't want to go get your hair cut by someone who's also a part-time fry cook, right? You know, maybe you do, but I would rather have someone who is a full-time beautician as opposed to someone who's doing three jobs. That's just me. Yeah, it depends on what that other job is, whether or not they're going to cut my hair. But um, there you go, that's it, right. <laughs> you know, I'm just not sure. Um, but you, so you, you're not going to have to spend a lot of time educating people but it sounds like you do spend a little bit of time educating people no I don't do that kind of law um, yeah. and I like what you said about the law is like the medical field it's filled with specialties mm -hmm. and you know you don't necessarily want um, your ophthalmologist to be setting your broken leg now if there's no other but doctor around hey hey I'm gonna go for him but <laughs> I'm gonna try to find somebody who has some familiarity with bones to do that kind of thing. Um, I think I've hit most of, of what I wanted to talk to you about. Is there anything that you would like? We, like I said, this these sessions are being directed toward both our students who might be interested in a legal career, or now they might find out that, hey, I can do something in the legal field that's not being, you know, a trial lawyer or Let's face it, it seems so much of law anymore is is completely absorbed with PI work, personal mm -hmm. injury lawyers. That's you turn on the TV and you either see political ads during the elections or you see personal injury ads and the big law firms. But is there anything that you would like to say to our students who might be interested in it or to our community? Because we're we're trying to reach out to the community and and educate them a little bit into the legal specialties. What would you like? Is there anything you'd like to say to them? To yeah, let's let's speak to students first. The, the first advice I ever give anyone who asks me, you know, what or they they say that they're thinking about being a lawyer. I said, okay, that's fine. Um, if you're still thinking about it, right when when push comes to shove, when you're applying, you don't want to be a lawyer. Um, law school itself is you know, outside of me committing to my wife, law school was the biggest commitment of my life. Um, it's expensive. It's not easy. Um, it's funny, like you go to law school, everyone who goes to law school was at one point the smartest person in a class somewhere. And then when you meld uh, all those minds together, it's, it's, a, it's an intimidating place. Um, so I would encourage anyone who is thinking about being a lawyer to talk to lawyers and talk and don't go in it half-heartedly because it, it will chew you up and spit you out. You know, it, it's, it's hundreds of pages of reading. It's dedicated. And that's, and I'm, I'm saying that still in my profession today, you know, it's, um, I'm exhausted at the end of, uh, of most of my days because I've not stopped reading and I've not stopped thinking. And it's just a different, type of tired than what you're used to. So I would not go into it half-heartedly. I, I would make sure that you have a, a solid, but I would also not ever be scared of it. If, if it's if it's what you want and if it's what you love and you're willing to work, then don't be afraid of the unknown. You know, you can make what you want out of your law degree. I, I, you know, I'm in a group text with a bunch of guys I play fantasy football with. We got one person who's in JAG, so with the military. I got a couple PI guys. I got a big firm guy from a, from a buddy who clerked 
in the, uh, I believe he was in the Sixth Circuit for two years. He clerked in the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. So just right under, uh, I think he's, he's actually shortlisted for Gorsuch as a, as a clerk, but didn't quite make the cut for there. So, I mean, you know, he's doing big form work. I got a sports agent that I went, you know, there's just so many mm-hmm. areas that you can go into with, with the legal field. And if you work and if you, if you find that industry, uh, or even the industry within the industry. One of the great things I love to watch is um, the evolution of esports, right? So uh, I know UPAC has a League of Legends team video game that I'm familiar with. I played when I was growing up. Um, esports agent law has blown up since I was in high school to now because of the contracting with these 20-year-olds who've never been in the real world and, and, and there was no specialty, no one looking for their interests. There's always an industry within the industry. So if you want to go to law school, do it. And you will find something that you want to do. Um, as far as the community outreach goes is, you know, uh, I like to say, meet a lawyer. Uh, don't just tell lawyer jokes, right? We're, we're fine. We're people. Um, are there bad lawyers? Sure. But there, there's bad doctors and there's, you know, bad nurses and bad teachers. Uh, but, uh, you know, the legal field gets such a bad rap. And I don't know, maybe it's not a bad rap. Maybe it's an accurate rap. But, you know, you, you just see you see the stories and the horror stories um, of, of predation uh, through the law, whether or not it's frivolous lawsuits against uh, your local food city or Walmart or, or whether or not it's, you know, massive fraud um, being exposed. But, you know, those aren't the majority of the of the attorneys that I have in my circles, right? Most of us are just doing a day job. We we go to our office, we come home, and, it, and it's fine. It's just it, when you're outside the legal field, it, it really is interesting. You know, if it's not law and order, you don't really think about it as being something that an attorney does. But it's just so much more. Um, you know, I could talk for hours and hours about uh, some of the intricacies of of what we deal with and. And it, it, I find it fascinating, right? And, and that's the, the most important thing. If you're fascinated by a subject, I had no idea I was going to be in the cost containment field. The reason that I took a job in healthcare is because I didn't think there was opportunity to raise a family in Eastern Kentucky. So I moved to Louisville and I took an office job. And then I just love the office job that I took. Um, the plan was to take an office job and then apply to a bunch of law firms and do the PI stuff, you know, or, or but then I fell in love with the healthcare industry and, 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 and more so now the, how to make it better right that's that's what cost containment is is you know I, I, don't, I don't want to come out come out from this with me thinking that the healthcare system is is, is bad it just needs work done right you know the the amazing things that 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 uh, Pfizer and moderna have done with the vaccine you know the us is the hub of of medical innovation but goodness gracious can we not find a middle ground between this this multi-billion dollar or multi-trillion dollar industry and and being able to get good um, health care to 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 the, the citizenry and I think there is and, and and that's what I'm passionate about and that's why I love going to work every day um I'm so proud of you um you. it's it's been a great pleasure talking to you. I want to thank the Bar Foundation for allowing us to put together these conversations to allow me to indulge in visiting with some of my alums, which means a great deal to me. I want to thank Corey Krieger for being a guest and talking to us. And I want to reinforce a little bit of what he just said. And I think it shows in our entire conversation. Lori. Corey's found a passion for what he does. I was going to say a love, but it's, it's a different kind of thing. It's an intensity. It's a passion. He truly has found a niche where he can serve his religion, where he can serve his law passion, where he can serve his family. And as somebody who watched him from a very young undergraduate student go through that and develop and grow, I, um, on just a very personal level, I'm very proud of what he does. I'm very proud of the, the passion that he's shown. And I, 
I want to thank him again for sharing that with you, for introducing the students in the community to possibly another option for a legal career. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Uh, I, I would love any opportunity to speak to anyone. Hopefully once we get this whole pandemic thing behind us, we can do some, maybe some live stuff, but uh, I, I really truly appreciate the opportunity. And Nancy, a lot of people would say that this was a great talk, but I think we both agree that this was a good talk. Good talk. <laughs>